welcome to Auto Shenanigans. How the devil are you? Have you had a good week? My name is John. Thank you very much for joining me for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. Today, we'll be driving through Gloucestershire, Herefordshire and Worcestershire along the 21.6 mile long M50 motorway. The M50 opened in 1960 and compared to the other motorways, it's a little unusual. Much like the M45, it seems to have been left behind in the 60s, having seen little to no upgrade works in its lifetime. Who knows, maybe the M50 offers a driving experience more in line with the 1960s, we're going to find out. The M50 was the second motorway built from scratch in the UK, however it was the third to open after the Preston Bypass and the M1. They started with junctions 1 to 4 which were completed by 1960 and the remaining junction 1 to the M5 link came along two years later in 1962. Originally the M5 terminated at the M50 in what's called a trumpet design junction which gave us a rather fantastic yet unsafe 270 degree turn. This turn is also the reason why today we can see a sort of semicircular shape by the junction because that's where the carriageway used to go. Following the M5's widening in the 90s they took the opportunity to redesign the junction into a simpler design following years of accidents and problems. Remember how I said they started with junctions 1 to 4 and then added junction 1 to the M5 link after? Indeed, what that seems to have resulted in is technically an extra junction, if you will. The Strentium interchange could perhaps also be junction 0, if you will, of the M50. Junction 0, or the Strentium interchange, nearly became a four-way motorway interchange rather than the rather crap thing we've got today. Plans were drawn up in the mid to late 1960s to construct a motorway that would run from Strentium to Solihull. This motorway would have run from here, junction zero, the Strentium interchange, and all the way up to the M40 and M42 as we know it today at the Umberslade interchange. There was a lot of toing and froing and the motorway was quite difficult to sort of get off the ground. There was a lot of opposition from the local residents and the government's own environmental department. They were still thinking about it in the 1970s, so when the oil crisis came along, it was pretty much game over for that motorway. All the funding was pulled and the idea was abandoned. Before the Strentium interchange came about, the M50 used to terminate here at Junction 1, where you'll find the A38. When the junction was originally built, they installed cattle grids on the slip roads themselves. These have since been removed, but if you look off the southbound slip road on Brockeridge Road, you'll find a cattle grid that was installed as part of that original construction. A short distance up from Junction 1 and we find the first of three bridges to be found between Junctions 1 and 2. All of these bridges have got what appear to be abandoned slip roads attached to them. However, this doesn't look like the usual sort of emergency services access. I think this is because of bridge repairs and maintenance vehicles. In 2012, it was announced that the M50 would be closed to make essential repairs to the old and crumbling bridges. This wasn't agreeable with the local residents who obviously used the motorway quite regularly, so an alternative plan was formed where they'd work on the bridges from the ground up. This meant that the motorway would only need a few lane closures rather than a complete shutdown so they went ahead with the plan. If anyone knows otherwise please do let me know but I think all of the slip roads we see on the bridges on the M50 were installed to allow access for those repairs to be carried out. These days it's probably mostly used as farm access, it doesn't look like you're going to be getting a car down here anytime soon. Next, we go from a bridge that's been repaired and retained to one that's been removed completely. The Mulburn to Ashchurch Railway branch line used to follow the course of Bow Lane and cross over the M50 just near the Queen's Hill Bridge. When the motorway was installed, they constructed this bridge to carry both the road and the rail across it. However, whilst the bridge opened along with the motorway in 1960, the railway closed in 1964, so it made the railway bridge a bit of a waste. The railway half of the bridge sat abandoned for decades, up until 2012 where it was removed over safety concerns. Today, you'll easily be able to see where the track and the bridge used to be. However, if you want to see what it used to look like before its removal, have a look on Google Street View. Next up is the Queen Hill Bridge or Viaduct. This impressive 750 metre long bridge carries the M50 across the River Severn. This bridge is what's called a dual construction bridge where effectively you've got two bridges running parallel to one another, each carrying their own set of traffic lanes. It was as early as 1947 that ideas came about for building a bridge here. The then Ministry of Transport hired a consultancy firm to draw up some plans. However, their findings were that the proposed site was an area of great natural beauty. So the Ministry of Transport banged the bridge in anyway. Fuck the countryside. Now, as I said, the Queen Hill Bridge takes you over the River Severn. However, before you reach the river, if you look either side, you'll notice two lakes. 
I believe this is the site of an old quarry that was owned by Semex. There's an awful lot of sand and gravel extraction in the area, but I think this site saw closure somewhere around 2017. The quarry has since been returned to nature, but I did find a couple of these conveyor machines kicking about. I'm not sure if they're part of the old quarry site or if it's actually farm machinery that's been left here, but it's something interesting to look at, isn't it? Unfortunately, when researching things to explore or talk about for this series, you come across stories that are not always so nice to talk about. We're going to deviate a little bit from my usual subject matter, and if you don't want to hear about a murder, then you're probably going to want to skip along for a minute. In 1988, Marie Wilkes, who was two months away from expecting her second child, got lost and made a wrong turn onto the M50 heading towards Strensham. Shortly after, her car broke down, leaving her and her 11-year-old sister and one-year-old son stranded at the side of the road. Now, of course, there were no mobile phones around, and this time, so she made her way to the nearest SOS phone at the side of the motorway, in this case, phone box 2076B. During the four minutes of the phone call that she made trying to resolve her situation, Marie vanished, leaving the operator listening to nothing but the sound of the passing traffic. This prompted a rather urgent response from the police, who arrived on the scene to find Marie's 11-year-old sister and one-year-old son walking down the hard shoulder alone. Two days later, a Marie was found hidden in the undergrowth three miles from the location where she made the phone call. Tragically, it hadn't ended well for her. Following a lot of media attention, a man called Eddie Browning was named as the main culprit, and he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. However, he was released in 1994 following an appeal. It turns out that he won the appeal because the police had misfiled a lot of the evidence when it came to the original trial. It's not 100% clear if Eddie was actually the man responsible for the crime or not, and to this day, the case remains open as an unsolved murder. Right, let's move on from that and have a laugh about something. Junction 3, just take a quick look at it. What, in tarnation? I mean, that makes no sense at all. What this is, is the result of road planners having a few drinks, probably with a bit of crack sprinkled in for good measure, because this junction makes no sense whatsoever. However, despite its rather stupid design, it turns out there might actually be a reason for it. I mean, it's not actually a good reason, but uh, if you look across all of the junctions on the M50, you'll notice that no two junctions are the same. And that's because the Ministry of Transport used the M50 as a little bit of an experiment to see what would work and what wouldn't work. So they tried all these different junction designs, so if there was something that that worked well, it could be replicated across other parts of the motorway network. And it's not much of a surprise that across the motorway network, there are no other junctions like Junction 3 that we see here on the M50. Because it's shit, and nobody wanted to make that mistake again. The M50 is only a two-lane motorway, so to have slip roads that short is really quite dangerous. It's only saving grace is that the traffic is fairly minimal, but could you imagine that being rolled out across the M1? Whilst you're on your way to Junction 3, you'd have passed over the Ledbury and Gloucester railway line, a railway line that opened in 1885 and then closed to passenger services in 1959, with freight operations continuing until 1964. The majority of the railway was built on an old canal that they converted. It's also here that you'll spot a road that was severed by the M50 when it was constructed. This is how the hamlet of Four Oaks used to look before the M50 came along, and we can see today that they've rerouted the road through the woods and over a bridge. And just like that, we arrive at Junction 4 of the M50, also known as the Traveller's Rest Roundabout. It's here that we find the end of the M50, or, to look at it another way, the start of the M50 if you're heading towards Strensham. The M50 definitely delivers on its promise of being old. As you drive along, you'll notice the incredibly narrow hard shoulders, the same hard shoulders which end at every bridge. And those bridges are very much made out of concrete, lacking in any real visual appeal compared to others. I was right to do this in the car. I was just about to piss it down. It's a shame the next location's outside. However, there is one nice bridge that you'll pass under on the way to Junction 4, and that's the Rudhall Bridge. It's unlike any other on the M50, with its locally sourced, organic, grass-fed stone frontage. To be fair, I think all the bridges round here are free range, and it is a nice bridge, but we need something a little bit better to end the video on, I think. Ah, here we are, the Selleck Suspension Bridge. I have cheated a little bit. You're going to have to take a 10-minute detour off Junction 4 of the M50 to see this one, but we were in the area, so why bloody not? The Selleck Suspension Bridge was designed by Scottish engineer Lewis Harper and opened in 1895. It was built to serve the churches of Selleck and King's Carpel, or Capel, Capel, I don't know. Please do let me know in the comments. 
And before the bridge came along, there was actually a small ferry service that would give passengers a lift to and from each of the riverbanks. That's all we've got time for this week, guys. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you liked the video. If you did, there's a button specifically for that. And I'm still in the hope that we can get the channel up to 100,000 subscribers. So if you haven't already, please consider subscribing. It'd be much appreciated. If you've already subscribed, then thank you very much for your continued support. Enjoy the rest of your week, whatever it is you get up to. My name's John, and you've been watching Auto Shenanigans, and I'll see you guys next time for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. I'm going to get out of here because it's going to piss it down any second. This bridge is rather rickety.